Well, hello there, everybody. This is David Russell. Welcome to the first launch event of Faith Unaltered. And yes, the only launch event. Hopefully we go on for a long time. But uh, welcome. We're so excited to have our friend Dale Glover. He is going to be talking about the Evil God Challenge. Welcome, Dale. Hey, David. Thanks for thanks for bringing me on to speak about this. Yeah, man. You know, I'm really excited to hear it. Um, are you? Uh, um, you're going to take over the show. We're okay. Gonna, you know, we're just we'll we'll be there to monitor or whatever. You know, you have your freedom in Christ. Um, did you get enough sleep last night? <laughs> uh, Caleb Jackson kept me up till like 1:30 a.m. So. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> no, it's it's good. Uh, yeah. I, wow, I I say, Whoa, that's a lot. <laughs> that was a lot later than I could have imagined. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, man, we had a good time last night, everybody. We went and uh, we talked on KEQQ uh, radio, and then we went from there to the after party and had an open mic, and everybody just decided to talk about whatever topics they wanted to, you know, which I thought was really, really cool, really fruitful discussion. Um, fun just to kind of nerd out and talk theology, man. So yeah. kind of remind me of the old uh, campfire days, you know, where you just sit around a campfire and discuss anything and everything. But anyways, yeah. Dale... Brother, uh, whatever you need, man, you just let us know, and uh, yeah, uh, have your freedom, brother. All right, awesome. Yeah, so so once again, thank you so much for for letting me be a part of the the launch event here. Um, obviously, I'm here to talk about the Evil God Challenge. Um, <laughs> so I just want to share my screen here, and just want to start off with a quick little two minute video from Stephen Law. Um, hopefully, that's is that showing up for everybody. The video. Yeah, it looks good, brother. Yep. All right, cool. So I'll just uh, give you guys a bit of a primer by playing this. There, many atheists argue the world contains too much suffering for it to be the creation of a good God. There are wars, diseases, and natural disasters. Horrific human and animal suffering is built into the very fabric of the world we're forced to inhabit. Isn't this good evidence that even if there is a creator, he is not all powerful and all good. Of course, the faithful try to explain the suffering. Some talk about free will. They say God could have made us puppet beings that always behaved well. But if we're God's puppets, we're not responsible for what we do. God cut our strings so that we can freely choose to do good. But then some of us choose to do evil and cause suffering. That's the price God pays for our free will. So have we shown it's reasonable to believe in God after all? I don't think so. Suppose that, after a bump on the head, I come to believe the universe was created not by a good God, but by an evil God. I believe there's a single, all-powerful creator whose malice knows no bounds and whose wickedness is beyond our comprehension. Who believes in a God like that? Almost no one. Why not? Because the world would look much more like a torture chamber if it were created by such a powerful and wicked being. There's too much love and laughter, and too many people being kind and helping each other for this to be the creation of an evil god. Yet notice I can explain why my evil god allows good, the same way religious folk explain why their good god allows evil. I can say, my evil god could have made us puppet beings that always did bad things. But if we're his puppets, we're not responsible for what we do. That's why evil God cut our strings and set us free, to allow us to freely choose to do evil. Unfortunately for evil God, some of us then choose to do good deeds. That's the price evil God pays to allow moral evil. Have I shown that belief in an evil God isn't absurd? No, of course not. Sure, I can cook up such ingenious explanations to defend both belief in a good God and belief in an evil God. But still, we can be pretty sure there's no evil God, can't we? Mm. So why can't we be pretty sure there's no good God either? We may not know why the universe exists, but surely we are justified in supposing it is not the creation of either of these two gods. All right, so, so that's it for the video. Um, yeah, so, so that was Stephen Law. Um, he's one of the main proponents. 
Um, so I just want to switch over to my PowerPoint. Uh, hopefully, is that showing up for everybody? Yep. Awesome. All right. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be presenting on addressing the evil God challenge. And just obviously the first question to ask is, well, what is an e the evil God challenge? And basically it starts, it addresses the notion of classical theism, right? So the notion that there's a single being that is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. Um, we call this the good God hypothesis. And obviously the evil God hypothesis would be the same, an omnipotent, omniscient being that's omnimalevolent instead. Um, so, you know, think of the various arguments for why you believe in a good God. Maybe you believe because of the cosmological argument or a teleological argument or ontological argument, um, and then ask yourself, does this really prove that God is good uh, versus an evil being? And obviously the evil God challenge is a challenge to good God theists and says, well, what justifies your belief in the good God hypothesis over the evil God hypothesis uh, based on these evidences? Um, so just a bit of quick history on the evil God challenge. Obviously, this was uh, coined, the term was coined by Stephen Law back in 2010. He really kind of popularized this. Um, but obviously, the argument goes back way beyond that. It, it just went under different names, you know, so it was the challenge from anti-theism or maltheism or demonism, stuff like that. Um, and it was Stephen Law who first coined this word, the evil God challenge. Um, now, one thing that's really important to understand is that, you know, what, what exactly does it mean when we're talking about an evil God? Obviously, we had those three properties that I mentioned, but there isn't really a single definition of what an evil God is. You know, some people say, oh, well, he has to be maximally selfish or he's maximally hateful. He's so hateful, he hates himself. Um, so there's a lot of um, confusion in the literature as to what exactly an evil God is. But essentially, in order for the challenge to work, it's just you have to match it to whatever the definition of the good God that you're comparing it to is. Um, so obviously this establishes the symmetry between a good God and an evil God. And this is what's called the symmetry thesis. So what is the symmetry thesis? It's, it's basically can be represented by a set of weighing scales, right? So, you know, you have these various evidential factors in favor of a good God, um, but then you have those same evidential factors equally support an evil God and they roughly balance out in the end. You don't know which one to believe. And it's important to note that law only argues for broad symmetry. So he doesn't deny that you could have certain local asymmetries. Maybe there are certain factors or evidences that do favor a good God over an evil God, but they're so insignificant that they don't really tip the scales over in very much in favor of a good God. Again, they're roughly symmetrical. Um, so just some examples of local asymmetries that Law himself admits, you know, something like the Christian story of the fall. He admits that can't be paralleled on a evil God version of the fall um, or the inherent goodness of free will, stuff like that. Um, OK, so it's a, this is really important. There's three fundamental versions of the evil God challenge. So the first is the weak evil God challenge. And this is the one that I found the most problematic for me back in my doubting days. Um, but it basically says, well, look, given that you have this symmetry thesis, you have no reasonable grounds to privilege belief in a good God over an evil God. So what you should do is you should suspend judgment between the two. You should be agnostic. Um, then we have the second type, which is called the strong argument from incoherence. And this is an argument for atheism. So it, it goes beyond that. It says, look, given you have this symmetry thesis, atheism must be true because, well, you believe that a good God exists, but they're symmetrical. So you should also believe that an evil God exists and you can't have both. That's logically contradictory. You, you can't have two omnipotent beings, for example. And you know, various philosophers have provided arguments as to why there can only be one omnip omniscient or omnipotent being. Um, so because that's contradictory, you should abandon belief in the good God and the evil God. Therefore, you become an atheist. Then there's the ver strong version from inconsistency. So this is the version that's popularized for, with Stephen Law. All evil God challengers today kind of go for this strong version here. And it's basically the same thing. It's an argument for atheism. It says, given the symmetry thesis, atheism must be true because, well, you guys automatically assume that an evil God is uh, absurd or incoherent or implausible, whatever. 
But again, the good God and evil God are symmetrical. So you have to reject the good God hypothesis as equally incoherent and absurd. Therefore, you should believe in atheism. Um, so those are the three versions there. Um, so just to put these in standard form. So the, the weak version is a three premise argument. Basically, you can say, look, if, if the good God hypothesis is broadly symmetrical to another hypothesis, like the evil God hypothesis, then both hypotheses are equally probable to be true. Well, if both hypotheses are equally true, probable to be true, then you ought to suspend judgment with respect to them. Premise three, then, is where the symmetry thesis comes in. You say, well, it is a fact that the good God hypothesis is broadly symmetrical to the evil God hypothesis. Therefore, ultimately, you should suspend judgment. So that, that's, in a nutshell, how the weak version goes. It's important to note, so this is a deductive argument. It has a sub-argument, um, and it's logically valid, right? It, it utilizes hypothetical syllogism as well as modus ponens, which are valid argument patterns. So if you want to refute this argument from atheism, uh, from atheists and stuff, you have to um, say that the argument's not sound, that one, one or more of the premises are probably not true. Um, so... All right, so here's the strong version. This one's a little bit more complicated. There's more involved, but essentially the first part's the same, right? So if a hypothesis is broadly symmetrical, then both hypotheses are equally probably true, and you ought not to believe in, a, in one hypothesis over the other. Premise two, there's that symmetry thesis again. Well, guess what? The good God is symmetrical to an evil God. And then premise three, if the good God and evil God are equally probable to be true, and and you can prove that the evil God is unreasonable to believe in, well, then belief in the good God is likewise unreasonable. Um, premise four, it says, well, look, belief in the evil God is in fact unreasonable. And this is where atheists, evil God challengers will typically go into the problem of good and say that, well, an evil God can't explain the problem of good properly, as you saw in the video. Um, so obviously from that, yeah, it, it follows, look, both the evil God and the good God are unreasonable. You should abandon belief in both. And if that's the case, well, then you should believe in atheism. So that's, in a nutshell, how the argument works. Um, so how do we respond to, the, to these arguments? Remember, I said the, the only thing we can do with these valid arguments is attack the soundness or the deductive strength of the premises and say, yeah, but you haven't proven these are true. So the first type of response that theists have given is to reject premise seven. Um, so for example, why should we believe if, let's pretend the evil God hypothesis and the good God hypothesis are unreasonable for the sake of argument. Well, why the heck should I become an atheist? Maybe there's other options like a morally neutral or a morally mixed God. Um, and this, obviously this uh, retort is only relevant against the strong versions because the weak version doesn't try to argue for atheism. Um, so it applies to that. Um, now, obviously, generally speaking, I, I don't think that we as Christians can go for this response, right? We are, we've got divine revelation that God is good. So this is an unacceptable response for Christian theists, I would say. Uh, and that's a main problem with it. But um, one philosopher named Peter Forrest, he does actually argue for this. And he says, look, God be morally good, morally evil. Who gives a, a tinker's darn about that? That's totally irrelevant. As long as you can say, well, God would act righteously or act like he's good. And he gives an a priori argument here. So he says, look, there's a 50% probability that God has no moral character at all, meaning he's morally neutral. And there's a 50% probability that God has a moral character, just a priori without evidence, right? Um, okay, well, of the 50% uh, probability where he has a character, there's a 25% probability that he's morally evil in character. And there's a 25% probability that he's morally good in character. So he says, therefore, there's a 75% probability that God would at least act goodly or act righteously, and there's only at most a 25% probab prior probability um, that God would act badly. And you can see that represented on this pie chart here. Um, now, it is interesting. Peter Forrest uh, doesn't just leave it at this acting thing. He also suggests and postulates that it may be the case that a morally neutral or mixed God, um, in order to act righteously, he has to acquire 
a morally good character. So on that front, if his arguments go through, he, he uses various positions like moral cognitivism and motivation internalism and that sort of thing to, to get that position, which are very controversial. Um, I don't buy this argument personally, but nonetheless, I'm just presenting his argument as is. And, and he says, well, therefore, there's a 75% probability that God would have a morally good character as well, because he has to acquire that in order to act goodly. So just wanted to point out that that's his response to this premise seven. Obviously, as I said, the potential problems are, well, he relies on various controversial positions in philosophy. Um, and why should we think God is a pure consequentialist to begin with and that sort of thing. So, okay. So the next kind of response is uh, a retort to premise one, denying that premise one in the argument is true. You know, if a hypothesis is symmetrical, well, then you should suspend judgment or you ought to not believe in one hypothesis over the other. Um, so there's at least a couple responses denying this in the literature. So the first type of response is that fideism may be true. You, you, you don't need evidence. Who cares if there's evidential symmetry? Um, all that matters is faith. You can have faith and that's your reason for believing in a good God. The second one is sort of similar, and this is kind of denying epistemic evidentialism, right? So it goes for a different epistemology, something like pragmatic encroachment theory or a moral encroachment theory. So let's look at both of these responses here. So obviously in terms of fideism, um, this is again the view that religious beliefs at least can be justified by faith alone. And by faith here, we mean a non-evidence-based faith. Um, you Philosophical arguments and evidences, who cares about throw that in the garbage? We don't need that at all. And that includes philosophical arguments like the evil God challenge. You're talking nonsense. Um, and believe it or not, there have been a few philosophers who've at least considered this option. So people like Peter Forrest, who we mentioned above, John King Farlow, and even the atheist Graham Oppie has uh, talked about it as well. Um, now, how do, is this a good enough response for Christians? No. Um, unfortunately, fideism... It, well, I'm showing my bias, but I, I think it's rubbish. Uh, no. What, the Bible teaches Christians to have an evidence-based faith. Yes, we have faith and we have trust, but it's based on evidence. He's given us proof. He's given, given us the resurrection of Jesus as proof and that sort of thing. So I, I don't think that this option works in refuting premise one. Um, okay, well, what about appealing to different epistemic uh, things outside of evidentialism? So, for example, the philosopher Anastasia Philippa Scretton has taken the approach of um, saying, look, I can grant you, Mr. Evil God Challenger, yep, there is evidential symmetry. I, I just grant that for the sake of argument. But there's still a reason to favor belief in a good God over an evil God. It's just not evidence, but it's practical stakes or pragmatic stakes. Um, so pragmatic encroachment theory, this obviously utilizes that. And it basically says... Look, the, the evidence might be the same in any given case, but given the practical stakes involved, if you have high practical stakes, then this might raise or lower the sufficiency threshold. Um, so the sufficiency threshold just means like, what degree of evidence do you need before you can believe or disbelieve something? Um, and if you have high practical stakes, um, then maybe you shouldn't believe something. Even if you have evidence that you're 70% convinced it's true, you need a higher threshold of proof. And this is demonstrated through the famous bank thought experiment, right? So here we have person S, Dale, me, um, and person T, uh, the infamous bad boy, David Russell. And uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, David, but- um, so, I like so that. I like that David's the bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so bad, but he is a heretic. So he, he is. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah, we, we both work at the same place. Uh, it's Friday night. We're getting off work and we're both really, really tired. We worked really hard that day. We got our paychecks and we both want to go home straight away and just go to sleep and then cash our checks tomorrow. And evidentially speaking, we both have the exact same evidence that proves the bank will be open on Saturday morning. We can go home and sleep and then cash our check tomorrow. Um, and let's say we're 70% convinced for the sake of argument that the bank will be open given the evidence tomorrow. Well, there's a practical difference between me and David here. I've already paid my rent. Um, I have very low practical or pragmatic stakes. Whereas bad boy Russell over here, 
he hasn't paid his rent and he needs, he doesn't have enough money to pay it. He has to cash this check in order to be able to pay his rent. Otherwise, he's going to be kicked out on the street. Um, well, in this case, epistemically speaking, uh, pragmatic encroachment theorists say, well, look, Dale, 70%, that's good enough. That's sufficient threshold of, of proof for you to just believe the bank will be open and to go home. But you, Mr. Russell, that's not good enough. You need a higher standard of evidence before you believe. You need at least 95% proven beyond reasonable doubt or something like that. You should go to the bank. You should double check. You should confirm that it will be open tomorrow or or cash your check on Friday and that sort of thing. So that, in a nutshell, how this how this works in terms of the pragmatic approach. And then obviously Scruton says, well, look, there are pragmatic reasons favoring a good God. Uh, number one, it's been psychologically proven that belief in a good God is uh, beneficial for human well-being uh, compared to belief in evil beings like an evil God. And secondly, it also facilitates good moral consequences. So based on these practical considerations, look, there's a very high moral stakes. There's a high moral cost for believing in an evil God and relatively low moral benefits. The good God, on the other hand, is asymmetrical. There are high benefits for believing in a good God, and there's low moral co uh, pragmatic costs for believing in a good God. Therefore, the threshold for believing in a good God is lower than it is for an evil God. So that's how that works. Hopefully that makes sense for, for people. And here's, here's her argument in standard form. I won't go over that just to save time. Um, but one thing I did want to mention is outside of pragmatic encroachment, there's a very similar theory called moral encroachment theory. And, uh, these, there are proponents like Rima Basu, who I was lucky enough to meet because I took a grad seminar with Liz Jackson in epistemology and she actually knows all these people. So she actually brought in all of the people that wrote the papers we were reading. So, so that was great. Um, but yeah, it, it's exact same thing as the pragmatic encroachment thing. But instead of practical stakes, it looks at the moral stakes specifically. And the same reasoning applies. If the moral stakes are higher for an evil God, you require a higher sufficient, a higher amount of evidence to reach that sufficiency threshold. And on that basis, you should favor a good God. Um, all right, cool. So the next response is denying premise four in the argument, right? So this is the premise that says, well, belief in an evil God is unreasonable. You, you shouldn't believe that that's a reasonable thing to believe. Um, and obviously the response to this is, well, no, an evil God's, an evil God is not provably unreasonable, at least not based on the reasoning given by the evil God challengers. And that's important. Um, so it's important to mention here, just by way of clarification, obviously most good God theists, including myself, we do affirm that an evil God is unreasonable. Um, we think it's ridiculous to believe in that. Um, but the, the point of emphasis here is it's not based, it's not for the reasons that evil God challengers tell us. It's not based on the problem of good. Um, I think that's a false assumption of the uh, evil God challengers here. I think really it's based on a properly basic belief that we know God is good in a properly basic way. That's why most people automatically assume that, yeah, you mentioned an evil God. Phew, that's, that's ridiculous compared to a good God. Um, I'll get into more details as to what a properly basic belief is later on. But for now, just the important point here is, that, look, it, they're making a false assumption. They're assuming that people think an evil God is unreasonable. Why? Because of the problem of good. And that's not necessarily true. Um, but yeah, let, let's uh, look at this option for a second, right? So how, how does law establish that the evil God challenge is unreasonable by appealing to the problem of good? Well, he does this. Here's an uh, argument here. So for some actual goods in the world, um, we can't think of an immoral reason as to why an evil God would permit them. Therefore, probably there are no immoral reasons for why an evil God permits them. Well, if an evil God exists, he would not permit various goods if there were no immoral reasons for permitting them. Therefore, probably an evil God does not exist or is unreasonable to believe in. So that's how the argument works there. Um, and obviously, what's the, the main problem here? Well, it's the inductive inference between uh, 1 and 2 here, 4.1 and 4.2. Uh, this is a non-cogent argument, inductive argument. And it it's based on what Perry Hendricks calls the, quote-unquote, no-CM inference. This is kind of typical of 
uh, internet atheists and skeptics, uh, they, they appeal to the no see and inference. Well, I don't see any reasons, therefore there aren't any reasons. Uh, and this is fallacious and very problematic. Um, so how Perry Hendricks um, in, uh, deals with this is he invokes the skeptical theism thesis as a rebuttal. Um, skeptical theism is a position that denotes various positions and arguments. It's really mostly designed for tackling or refuting evidential arguments from evil against the existence of a good God. But obviously Perry, Perry here is saying that, well, that also applies with an evil God um, and the existence of goods. You know, we, he's arguing we have finite knowledge. We have an insufficient basis for judgment. So Hendricks uses the helpful analogy of a rabbit in a garden to illustrate this. Uh, searching for a rabbit in a garden. So obviously the evil God challengers, they're assuming, well, look, you're looking for the rabbit in a very small open garden. The, the garden is small. It's uniform in nature. So there's no like bushes to hide in. It's just an open grass thing. Uh, it's wholly accessible to us at once. And we have good vision. Um, well, in that case, yeah, if we don't find the rabbit, um, and we would have an expectation to find it. And therefore this no see inference is justified in this case. The problem is this is totally disanalogous to the situation of searching for an immoral reason for why an evil God would permit goodness. And uh, here's, here's the thing. So actually we're looking for a rabbit in a very large garden. I mean, think of the number of the states of affairs, past, present, and future, that you have to know with your finite human brain, you're not omniscient like an evil God and or a good God is being posited to be. Um, it's just impossible for us to know all of the states of affairs um, and to know all of the possible immorally relevant reasons as to why a good God would allow this goodness. Um, our sample size is just too small. The second disanalogy here is that, look, there are parts of the garden that are just not accessible to us at all. Um, you know, think of all the states of the affairs that are just too complex for our human brains to comprehend and that sort of thing. We're, we're really in the dark here. And there may be a whole set of immorally justifying reasons that we are just not aware of at all. So it's, it's false to assume that the reasons that we're aware of uh, represents the whole set. Thirdly, there's a third disanalogy, and that's the fact that there's no good reason to think the garden is uniform in nature. No, that there could be bushes and holes and uh, lakes and uh, buildings and a whole bunch of stuff obscuring the garden. And it's the same with the moral landscape when assessing an evil God allowing goods or a good God allowing evil. Um, we just don't know that all of the morally relevant circumstances have been the same at, for every case at all times. And Obviously, there's a, a case in point with biblical slavery versus the uh, U.S. slavery in the U.S. Uh, based in the 1700s, 1800s. Um, they're totally disanalogous um, in, in that sense, right? So the more there's different morally relevant circumstances that apply, and that, depending on your view, may or may not provide justification for allowing it. Finally, our vision is sub subpar. As the Bible says, we see through a glass darkly. Um, we have short-term focuses, our emotions and personal biases often distort our perceptions or cloud our moral judgments. Um, you can see the, the humorous pictures of the guys with beer goggles up there. I'm sure you guys know about that, uh, how alcohol distorts your, your perceptions and stuff. Well, it's, it's the same on the moral. Our finitude distorts. Our biases can distort um, our moral judgments. So, you know, it, it could even be the case, like El, like good old Elmer Fudd up there, who, who's looking for the rabbit. Yeah, he's right beside you, and you're looking down a hole like a fool. Um, well, it could be we are we have heard of immorally relevant justifying reasons, um, but we just don't recognize it because of our bias and that sort of thing. Um, all right, so I'll leave it up to Tyler and David. Um, I did kind of split it up. Do, do you think we should take like a five? five minute break or something to take questions. Are, are there any questions or comments on what I've covered so far? Or should I just keep going? No, nah, man, you're good. Uh, just keep going, man. Okay. All right, cool. Um, all right, cool. So finally, the last response to the evil God challenge, this is by far the most common theistic response. This is the response that I myself go for. Um, it entails denying the truth of the symmetry thesis. It says, look, it's not true 
that um, the good God hypothesis and the evil God hypothesis are symmetrical, broadly symmetri symmetrical in any way. Um, and by denying this premise, this refutes all versions, the weak and the both of the strong versions. All Every version of the evil God challenge is refuted if the symmetry thesis is false. Um, so this corresponds to premise two in, the, in my argument above and the symmetry thesis, we're gonna be denying that. Um, so there are various responses or types of asymmetries that uh, good God theists can appeal to. So the first are intrinsic or prior probability asymmetries. And this says that, look, a priori, the very concept of an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-evil deity is just not as intrinsically plausible or as coherent as the concept of an all-powerful, all-knowing good deity. Um, and some go so far as to say it's impossible that in, uh, such an evil being could exist. The second are natural theology-based asymmetries. So this is, looks at natural theology arguments like the ontological argument, uh, the argument from fine-tuning, um, the argument from religious experiences and phenomenal consciousness, um, the moral argument, ontological argument, all of that good stuff. And it, it says, look, these arguments um, tend to, are more probable on a get, go, good God hypothesis than it is on an evil God hypothesis. So we're denying they don't lend equal support to both hypotheses here. The third one is, this is the one that the evil God challengers love to bring up in most of their literature. Um, by the way, all of the people I'm mentioning in the papers, I'll be posting up on my blog on realseekerministries.wordpress.com. So you can read all the papers for yourself and get the details along with counter responses and stuff. But, but yeah, most of the atheists, the evil God challengers, they like to focus on this one here, the reverse versus theodicy versus reverse theodicies. Um, well, there's some asymmetries here. Um, mo and it says, look, they, they can't be mirrored with an evil God using reverse theodicies. And examples of this, I'll, I'll give that uh, when we get to it. And then finally, there's the category of other asymmetries. So these are asymmetries outside of the main three ones that I'll cover. Okay. Um, so one thing, just before I get into discussing the asymmetries, this is really important. Um, Okay, this is blocking. So this is something that evil God challengers employ called the bracketing move. Um, so not so people like Stephen Law or Asha Lancaster Thomas, they like to use this bracketing move, um, but not all e evil God challengers do. So for example, John Collins, who's one of the best in my opinion, um, he doesn't use this. He says this bracketing move is total foolishness, but it, it basically says, look, uh, you can bra let's pretend you prove that God is in you prove an intrinsic asymmetry or something. You, you prove that God is in an evil God is impossible to exist. The, the evil God challengers like law and L Lancaster Thomas here say, who cares? We can bracket that off. All we need to establish is that there's theodicy and reverse theodicy symmetry and, or possibly also natural theology symmetry. And that's enough for the argument to work regardless of any other asymmetries in other categories. It, those don't matter um, at all for the argument to work. Um, so obviously, okay, this isn't, there we go. Um, so yeah, and obviously this is something that's employed with the strong version of the argument. It doesn't necessarily apply to the weak version. Um, but yeah, how, how do we refute this? So, as I said, it, it's it's clearly violating logic, right? And probability calculus. Uh, number one, experts have proven and shown you have to take into account the prior probabilities. So those would relate to the intrinsic asymmetries. You have to take that into account. And you also have to take into account all other evidential considerations that are relevant to the truth or falsity of a hypothesis. It's irrational and illogical to just arbitrarily say, yeah, we're going to bracket off um, certain asymmetries and just not care about them arbitrarily because they're inconvenient. Um, then there's a, a second problem that when you're applying it, basically, so in order to, for this strong version of the argument to work, obviously Stephen Law is assuming, well, there's, it's common intuition that people think an evil God is unreasonable because there's too much goodness in the world. Uh, and he'll say, well, common intuition proves this. That's good enough. 
But unfortunately, in order for this bracketing move to work, you also have to admit there's also a proposition that common sense says there's more goodness than evil in the world. And even Law himself and Asher Lancaster Thomas, they admit that this is a common intuition. Um, well, you're being inconsistent then. Why, why do you accept common intuition as evidence for the first premise, the one that you need, but you reject common intuition when it comes to the premise that's inconvenient for you and is contradictory to the truth of, of P. So that's another problem here. Um, and then the third and final problem with the bracketing move is that it only works for a certain concept of the good God or evil God. And I call these GG star and EG star, right? So it only works to bracket off the other things if you're arguing for the good God who would create bliss world, maximal pleasure, all for all creatures at all times, no evil whatsoever. And or for in the case of an evil God, um, EG star, you know, the, he would create torture world. There's maximal pain for all creatures at all time. Um, in that case, yeah, the, the, any amount of goodness would refute EG star, uh, this nuanced definition of an evil God. And therefore, yeah, you can bracket off. In even if you prove an evil God is impossible, um, it doesn't matter. You can kind of bracket it off. Um, so that's how this works. But obviously, that's not what most theists believe in, in terms of a good God. Um, they do believe in a good God who would allow or permit certain types of evils. And similarly, an evil God person could make the same nuanced approach. They don't have to believe in a God who would uh, create a torture world. Um, now, interestingly, there is an asymmetry here that some philosophers have argued for, and they try to argue, uh, I'm not going to get into the details here for time's sake, but they try to say, well, actually, look, the good God, positing a good God does not entail the truth of GG star, the, of a good God who would create bliss world. But asymmetrically, the evil God hypothesis does logically entail the truth of EG star, that uh, a torture world creating God. Um, and again, there's arguments for that, why that's the case. Um, all right, cool. So let's get into some of these asymmetries. So let's start with the first category, intrinsic or impossibility uh, arguments, right? So these aim to demonstrate that an evil God as a concept is just intrinsically improbable um, or, and or even logically impossible. Um, and obviously that's asymmetrical with the good God because that is possible, that is intrinsically plausible. Um, so here's some of the recent proponents of this type of asymmetry. So you have philosophers like Charles Daniels, who kind of used a platonic argument to claim that an evil God, by, just by virtue of being omniscient and omnipotent, uh, would not do evil um, because no moral agent can knowingly or willingly commit evil. Obviously that's a controversial thesis. There's also Keith Ward, who provides a total of five arguments. He, he argues for, um, he says that a God that's omnipotent, omniscient, and omni-evil or omni-malevolent uh, forms an inconsistent triad. And he provides these five arguments as to why he thinks they're inconsistent. So, you know, for example, a God is necessarily, would have to be perfectly empathetic. Um, so that means he wouldn't be able to cause suffering without feeling that suffering for himself. Um, this would also entail that an evil God would be pathological and that's a diminishment or a deficiency. Uh, so he couldn't be omnipotent and that sort of thing. So that's kind of how he argues there. Uh, and then finally, Christopher Weaver, who employs a, a Kantian uh, type argument. Um, so looking at these, um, there are three main types of intrinsic asymmetry I want to focus on. So the first is that there's the argument that there's an ontological primacy between goodness over evil. Um, so this kind of relies on something called the privation theory of evil, where evil doesn't exist as an, a concrete reality of its own. It's, it's just an absence of the good. So in the same way you have light, there, there's no such thing as darkness, ontologically speaking. Darkness is just the absence of light. Well, that's what evil is. It's just the absence of good. That's known as the privation theory of evil. So obviously that would favor a good God over uh, an evil God if God is the grounding of all morals and that sort of thing. Um, one thing I would say is that the PTE is controversial today, um, but there are modern equivalents. So if you take sort of a functional functionalist approach where the good is defined as proper functioning uh, versus uh, evil is like a malfunction, then it's a little bit more plausible. 
sorry, to use this argument. Um, finally, also, Caelan K- Miller gives a simplicity argument on based on this factor. And he says that an evil God is not as uh, qualitatively simple as a good God um, because it pause an evil God would have to uh, posit not only goodness, but also a corruption or a diminishment of the good as well, because he would have these evil properties and stuff. So an evil God would be mixed and that's less simple than the pure good God who just has all these uh, proper functioning faculties and stuff. Okay. The second is that um, the divine non-moral attributes entail God's goodness. Um, So this is saying, well, look, we've got an omniscient God. We've got an omnipotent God. These two properties alone entail that God has to be good. He can't be evil. And there's been a few arguments. Richard Swinburne has has argued that God's omnipotence alone, that proves he has to be good. Others have argued that his omniscience alone uh, means he has to be good. Um, And then we mentioned Keith Ward, right, who argues for this inconsistent triad. He takes God's omnipotence, omniscience, and positing he's omni-malevolent or omni-evil, that's an inconsistent triad, and he gives his five arguments for that. So um, those are some of the, and I'll I'll post up uh, Keith Ward's paper and stuff so you can read the details for yourself, but running low on time. So, um, okay, finally, we have God's relationship to moral truths, and this is the final intrinsic um, asymmetry in terms of the metaphysical goodness. Um, so there are four main ways for proving that, um, think for envisioning God's relationship to moral truths um, and that those prove a good God is more probable than an evil God. <laughs> um, one thing just to mention is that only one of these views apply can possibly apply to an evil God. Um, and one other note here is that these four views, these relate to objectivist positions only. Um, but uh, philosophers Ben Page and Max Baker Hitch They've also argued in their paper, which I'll link to in my blog, um, that there's also an asymmetry, even if you grant moral subjectivism, even there, if morals are subjective, a good God is more probable intrinsically than an evil God. Um, Okay, so what are these four views? So the first is the Thomistic view, right? So this is kind of, we kind of covered this before. It's a functional account of goodness, um, and that's incompatible with an evil God. Um, because the functional account entails that goodness is more ontologically basic, right? Proper functioning versus you have this thing and it's a it's defect, it's it's defunct in some way, and that represents evil. Um, so yeah, that that would favor the functional account would favor God's goodness over the evil God. Um, there's also an alchemist view. So this says, well, look, ethical truths and and principles. They're determined by what God's arbitrary will is. So this is kind of one of the horns of the Euthyphro dilemma, right? Well, this view would be incompatible with an evil God hypothesis because good would just be whatever God's will says good, right? I will that that's good because I've said that's good. Therefore, it's good. So so a God would be good no matter what because it's all just based on his, his will arbitrarily. Um, so that doesn't work for an evil God if you take that view. Um, then there's the Augustinian view. This is the view I'm, I'm most partial to, I think. But it, it says, well, what, what is it that grounds ethics and moral truths? It's God's nature, his character. He, that grounds the, good, the paradigm of goodness. Um, so obviously on this view, this is incompatible with an evil God as well. Because again, wh- whatever God's nature is, that would be by definition and through logical necessity, that would be goodness. So only a good God could exist. Uh, you couldn't have an evil God um, because he would have a nature and that would be defined as the good. Finally, you have the Platonist view. And this is the only view where you can actually have a mere evil God. And this view says ethical truths, they're separate um, of God's internal nature or his will. Um, they're, They're totally independent of God. And this is a position known as moral Platonism or atheistic moral Platonism. And obviously Dr. William Lynn Craig has given three fantastic refutations of this view, this this is totally a, a non-viable option. Um, but yeah, obviously, if there are independent standards pretending that could be the case, then yeah, you could have a good God and an evil God, and they stand in relation to those things. One is good in relation to those independent moral 
moral uh, forms and the other's evil relative to them. Um, but the problem is, as I said, this view has been refuted. Uh, moral Platonism just doesn't work. It's a non-viable option. So therefore you're left with the three remaining ones and all three of those are asymmetrical. Only God could only be good on any of these views. Um, okay, so, okay, looking at the time. So another thing in terms of intrinsic implausibility is the arguments from Kayla Miller, who says that a good God is simpler than an evil God. And he, he looks mostly at qualitative simplicity, which is basically just prior, prioritizing the least number of principles or concepts and that sort of thing. Um, so how does he argue this? So there's three main arguments. I'll just focus on one for time's sake here. But uh, so the first argument that Kayla Miller gives is, well, look, as I said before, an evil God has to have a combination of both positive properties and negative properties. So, you know, an omnipotence, that's a positive property. Having power, that's good. That's a positive thing. Um, whereas a lack of that property, uh, impotence, is a negative property. That's bad, something like that. So an evil God, by definition, would have to have a combination, right? He's omnipotent and omniscient. Those are positive properties, but he's also morally evil. He has these mixture of negative and positive properties, whereas a good God is, he's pure. He's got pure positive properties, and that's simpler uh, relative to an evil God. Um, he also gives two other arguments from rationality. I won't go into those, uh, and reasons that a good God is simpler compared to an evil God based on that basis. Um, like I said, here's the third one based on phenomenal conservatism which just says the world is probably the way it seems. That's It's simpler to just assume that. And look, so, socially accepted doxastic traditions and practices, as well as evidence from religious experiences, almost universally support belief in a good God and not an evil God. So well, it seems like a good God exists. Given phenomenal conservatism, we should just believe that. It's simpler to believe that God is good rather than evil. Um, okay, so looking at natural theology asymmetries, um, I'll go over this quickly. So one thing that I like, I really like ontological arguments, and these are often parodied with devil parodies or maximally evil God, evil being type parodies. Um, and there's at least three types of asymmetries here. So uh, Alexander Proust and Joshua Rasmussen, they argue that, well, actually a good God is favored here asymmetrically to an evil God based on the nature of positive properties. We kind of discussed that in Simplicity above. Um, Robert Maydoyle and Zar Bernstein, they argue that a good God is favored over an evil God in virtue of perf perfections. What does it mean to be a perfection? And they argue, well, perfections only entail perfections. An evil God would entail certain imperfections. Therefore, you should favor a good God. Um, and then finally, you have Eugen Nagasawa, um, and he says that the evil God parody arguments, they're neither structurally nor dialectically parallel to a good God ontological arguments, and they fail for that basis. And again, I don't have time to go into the details. I will provide all of the, the writings here so you can look it up on, on your own free time if you're interested. Um, yeah, basically with the ontological argument, evil God challengers have really no good replies to this. They either just say, yeah, but the ontological argument itself is nonsense, so who cares? Um, or they provide refutations to try and say, well, actually, it can be paralleled, but they're only responding to certain versions. Namely, they have St. Anselm's version from back in the 11th century, and they say, well, that can be paralleled. Yeah, well, who cares? That that doesn't deal with the modern modal versions of ontological arguments or, or uh, perf perfection-based um, ontological arguments. So yeah, even if we grant you your symmetrical in terms of Anselm's ontological argument, which is a big if, um, you still fail in terms of modern ontological arguments. Okay, uh, next we have creation-based arguments. Um, so you have the philosopher Carlo Alvaro, and he says, look, only a good God could create the universe. An evil God couldn't have create the universe. And he provides these arguments, right? So premise one, most theists, and even atheists would also be willing to accept that uh, God is a perfect being, meaning by perfect, he means complete in and of himself. He exists a se. He, he's not dependent on anyone or anything outside of himself. Um, so premise two, that's what he's just saying. Perfection implies God can't be improved by anything external to himself, including creation. Um, 
Premise three, well, the good God does not need to create the world, um, right? It was a contingent act on his part, um, and he's already perfect. So, so by definition, a perfect being cannot be perfected further through the act of creating the world. Um, so, what, so why on earth? What's the motivating reason why a good God would create? Well, he is motivated for our benefit, the benefits that we experience by actually existing, that doesn't contribute to his goals or his own joy in any way because he's already perfect without us. Um, so he's totally other oriented. He has this good property of being other oriented and that provides motivation for creating. An evil God on the other hand uh, would not create the world for our benefit because he's evil, he's, he's a, a bugger. Um, but instead he can only create for his own selfish joy or to maximize evil, some, some kind of goal that's self-oriented, right? So since premise five, the evil God creates the world to benefit from it due to his own evil desire, then the evil God is not perfect. He needs creation in order to get something out of it, to either maximize evil as part of his goal or to take joy for himself out of seeing creatures suffer. That implies he's not perfect. Um, so therefore, on that basis, an evil God just can't exist um, because creation exists. Only a good God could be other oriented and therefore create despite getting no benefit for himself or uh, accomplishing a goal like maximizing goodness or something like that. Um, I have my own creation based asymmetry argument um, and it, kind of similar to Carlo Alvaro. I, I swear I did this independently of him and before I read his article, but it was great that we kind of are on the same page in terms of a good God being other oriented and having that motivation versus an evil God uh, being self oriented out of necessity. Um, but yeah, I, I look at four options where, okay, well, maybe creation was logically necessary on God's part and it adds overall value or disvalue. Um, I argue that that option is symmetrical but it's not, vi it's not a viable option. And um, uh, look up on my blog, I'm going to be posting up my master's thesis, which goes into the details as to why I argue this, but just to save time, I'll just go over it, right? And then option two is that creation is necessary, but it does not add overall value. Once again, I argue that's, that's not a viable option because we can prove that the creation is contingent. It's not logically necessary. And that takes out both of these options here. Um, and then you also have um, creation is contingent, but it adds overall value. So that's kind of like the evil God. He, he needs something. Uh, he needs to create something in order to derive that extra benefit. Um, whereas good God wouldn't do that. It's, it's contingent. Um, he doesn't, he's totally other oriented. Uh, and then finally, there's option four, which I argue is asymmetrical. That's where creation is contingent, but does not add overall value or disvalue. Um, so that's the only viable option, but it's asymmetrical because of the fact that it, only a good God would be other oriented in terms of his motivating reasons. Um, so, yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'll oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So the final category, uh, main category here is the theodicy versus reverse theodicies. Um, and people will bring up certain free will defense, right? So uh, we kind of see free will is seen as an intrinsic good by some philosophers. So this provides an asymmetry, right? So all else being equal, an evil God would not create the good of libertarian free will, um, whereas a good God probably would. And kind of going on, piggybacking on this, even the evil God challengers like Stephen Law, remember he admitted there are certain local asymmetries in the story of the fall with Adam and Eve. So, so even the evil God challenger himself, Law, he admits, look, when we examine Augustine's explanation of natural moral evils, um, and that both are rooted in the fall of Adam and Eve or original sin, there's no parallel narrative suggests itself. Um, an attempt to construct a reverse story about a reverse Adam and Eve who disobey an evil creator to bring about a reverse fall, it runs into insuperable obstacles. So yeah, e even the the main evil God challenger himself, uh, principle of enemy attestation, he admits this is an asymmetry here based on the free will defense. Um, okay, so very quickly, other asymmetries. So I said that there's properly basic beliefs, right? 
Um, so this is a subjective evidence, right? The properly basic beliefs are beliefs that are foundational um, and they're caused directly through grounded in some kind of experience, like a divine revelation of God or something like that. And they're proper with respect to what I call warrant. Uh, some people think it's justification, depending, whatever the epistemic criterion for knowledge is. Um, but yeah, we, we as human beings have certain God-designed faculties, like a sensus divinitatis, um, or you can take uh, the model that there's the self-authenticating witness of the Holy Spirit. And these provide directly attest to us or provide us with properly basic beliefs that God is good versus evil. So obviously the, the main question here is, well, this is a subjective evidence. Is that good? Can you use a subjective evidence to argue for an asymmetry? Um, I would argue yes. And that just gets into the validity of using uh, properly basic beliefs or not. Um, there's also an axiological asymmetry. So this is I'm, I don't think there's anything out there in the literature about this, really. Um, I think there is one paper on it, but I kind of argued for this in my thesis that a good God is more valuable than an evil God, therefore more likely rational to believe that uh, a good God exists. And again, I, I don't have time here because I want to make sure we have time for Q&A, but the main argument here that I use for my axiological asymmetry is Look, in the first place, some forms of circular reasoning are valid, are uh, warranted. And I appeal to people like Dan Johnson, Alexander Proust, and Andrew Moon. Um, and they've kind of proven, look, pretend there's an example. You're on vacation and you see your hotel room. And based on seeing it from your sense data, you go, okay, my room, you form the proposition, my room is number 314. Um Con subsequent to that, you also derive from the, the belief that your room is 314. You say, okay, and I also believe that my room number is the first three digits of pi. So now you have two rational beliefs. But then let's say two years from now, you totally forget about seeing your room number. You forget, you lose your belief that your room number is 314. You lose that original belief, but you re retain a remnant belief that your room number is the first three digits of pi. From that, you can derive back to the original belief that, okay, therefore my room number was 314. And this is a perfect, it's circular, but it's perfectly rational and it works. So I kind of came up with it, my own asymmetry with a similar process, right? So someone could believe in a good God for whatever reason. They were warranted based on an ontological argument, a cosmological argument, whatever it was that got them to believe in a good God originally. And then from that, they derive something akin to what's called the principle of optimalism, or sometimes it's called principle of optimism. So, so philosophers like John Leslie or Nicholas Rescher argue for this. And this just entails that whatever the best state of affairs is will be actualized and will actually exist. Um, now, the problem with uh, Nicholas Reschler, people that argue for this position, this principle of optimalism, very controversial. I, I don't believe in it myself. Um, at least for the reasoning they give. They have to give sort of platonic reasoning that there's principles existing abstractly out there or something, and they just don't work. But I do think it works if you start out with belief in a good God. I think we can prove that given a good God, um, then the, something akin to the principle of optimism is true. And then let's say one of these atheists forget that they're about their belief in a good God or their warrant for that, but they retain this remnant, the principle of optimism. Well, then they are rational in deriving back to, well, given the principle of optimism, that entails that a good God must exist. And, and this is fully rational. So in a nutshell, that's my axiological asymmetry. And therefore, by showing that God is a good God is more valuable than an evil God. Um, and the truth of this principle of optimism, if you have a warranted belief in that, bada boom, bada bing, you can believe in a good God. Um Okay, so the last part, I promise, this is the last section here on other asymmetries. So believe it or not, uh, we've been looking at asymmetries that favor a good God over an evil God. But remember, Stephen Law, I said he's only arguing for broad symmetry. He can admit some local asymmetries so long as they're very insignificant pebbles rather than boulders in that, that scale. But there are some atheists and skeptics who try to say, yeah, but there are asymmetries that favor an evil God over a good God. Um, and they say that there are some local asymmetries there, 
And overall, the symmetry thesis is maintained because they balance out. Um, so here's just a couple of quick examples. So one example is by Asha Lancaster Thomas, who, uh, if she's listening to this, uh, she's great. She was a lot of help um, for me doing my master's thesis on this topic. Um, but I disagree with her. Obviously, she's an atheist. But um, yeah, she she argues, look, there are evil being religious experiences. So religious experiences favor an evil God over a, a good God. And her argument is that, well, number one, there are various experiences of evil beings, not necessarily an evil God. And I made sure to check with her. So she, she doesn't know of any experiences of an evil God directly. Um, but there are evil being things like encountering Satan or demons and stuff like this. And these favor an evil God over a good God in her estimation. And also she uh, somewhat surprisingly says, even the good God religious experiences prove that an evil God is more likely than a good God. Why? Well, because there are contradictory good God experiences. So this leads to religious contradictions, religious wars, and all this stuff. That's more likely to occur if God is evil than if he's good. Um, so that's her argument. And then the second and final evil God favoring asymmetry is by a guy named Chris Byron, who argues based on antinatalism. So that, that's a position saying that it's better not to have kids than to bring kids into this wretched world and, and all that stuff, right? So <clears throat> he adopts that, an antinatalism argument to create a reverse creation asymmetry argument. And he says, well, actually, no. Um, only an evil God could create the universe. A good God wouldn't create this filthy universe, this hor horrid universe kind of thing. And he adopts kind of the antinatalism argument as proof for this, right? So he has the following principles. Number one, pain is bad. Yep, agreed. Two, pleasure is good. Uh, yep, agreed, I guess, more or less. But then there are these other principles, right? So three, the absence of pain is good. Um, and, and that is good even if no one is enjoying that good. So just the absence of pain is good in and of itself, according to him. But four, there, here's the asymmetry. The absence of pleasure is not necessarily bad, um, even, even if there's somebody whose absence is a deprivation. Nobody's being deprived, right? No one exists to be deprived of the absence of, of that. So um, I screwed that up. But but yeah, um, you know, so he, he appeals to, look, the example. People tend to think that it's good um, when an ill-prepared couple uh, engages in antinatalism. They say, look, I'm not ready to have kids, um, so I'm not going to have, uh, going to have kids. Um, well, in this case, that absence doesn't constitute um, an, an evil or something like that. But by the same contrast, no one thinks that empty space in a room uh, needs to be filled with like pleasure experiencing individuals. Our non-existence or uh, doesn't constitute a bad state of affairs. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. So, so that is it. Um, I'm finished. So, so yeah, I'll turn it over to Q and A time. Obviously, you have this question: Could God be evil? Well, my emphatic answer is no. Uh, the good God is too strong. So, thank you for listening. Right on, Dell. I really, really appreciate you coming on. And let's see, let me get this off of here real quick. And no, I just really appreciate you coming on and giving me a more thorough explanation of the evil God challenge. I was, and I apologize again for being confused on the subject last oh, night a little bit, but you've definitely opened my mind to this. I'm going to have to dive into it more because I'm going to be honest, guys, like a lot of this was over my head, but I'm excited to dig in to the topic a little bit more. So thank you, Dell, for coming on and giving a thorough explanation of that. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, hope was it at least um, even if it was some of it was over your head. I'm, I'm horrible at speaking on a pop level, but um, did it at least give you like the structure kind of thing? Yeah, okay, yeah, cool. I, I could follow it. I've just got to go back and re-listen to it. But I'm sure anybody that's watching, anybody that will watch it, they can follow it. I just, for me personally, I've got to go back, pause it, you know, think yeah. about what you've said, and then move on to the next, you know, slide. So cool. That's just yeah. me. Yeah. But yeah, no, nope, so I'm the same. So all right, cool. Yeah, it was it was very thorough, Dale, and I appreciate it, and I, I you know, I enjoyed it too. Awesome. So yeah. Thank
So, guys, that is the we're coming to the conclusion of our first show. Yep. Um, stand by for the premiere of our interview with Dr. Bill Meltz. That's what's coming next. 1230. That's right. So, again, I just want to give everybody the lineup. Again, if I can find it. <laughs> you ain't got that memorized? <laughs> Boom! I'd rather give it to people. I I, I'd <laughs> rather give it to people as a visual, Tyler. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I, I am a visual learner, so. Right. So there's your lineup. Next is Dr. Bill Meltz at twelve thirty. Our narrative structure guys will be on at two. Caleb and Travis at four. Dr. Paul Anderson at 530, and we will finish with the debate, guys. We hope you stand by. This is Faith Unaltered. I am David Russell. This is Tyler Fowler over next to me. We appreciate it. Have a good day. Bye-bye. All right. We are done. Yeah, awesome. Well, yeah, that was a bit of a, <clears throat> a, bit of a mouthful and that sort of thing, but uh, yeah. I'm I was, can I just ask a question real quick like I didn't I didn't want to ask it on air but let me just ask you Dill when when did this stuff become so complicated like is God good is God evil why can't we just take what Jesus said there's no one good but God alone right and, and go with that you know what I'm saying because to me it just seems like if somebody has a problem figuring out if God is good or evil they've got an issue with scripture at that point, right? And we need to be talking to them. And just my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, but we need to be talking, telling them the gospel versus why God is good versus why he's evil. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Um, so you, like even with atheists and stuff like that, you're saying? like, Yeah, yeah. The, the, so the, the only- Because an atheist, in my opinion, an atheist should be asking if God is evil or good. They don't believe in God, you know what I mean? So why, why does it matter to them? Well, because they're they're using it to get you right. So we're on the defense here, right? So it's right. it's it's either a challenge that gets you to abandon your belief in a good God, and you have to. They're asking you like, oh, well, why do you believe in a good God? Oh, you're you're such a such a fool, and if and you have to provide a, an answer to that along the lines that I've given, or you could say that it's scripture. Like I, I read scripture, and that produces produces a properly basic belief. But uh, the, the Holy Spirit attests that there's this asymmetry so simple as that i don't need the objective arguments and stuff um but then with the okay, what do you say about this i mean for me the evil god challenge really does it, it never really hit home with me because it ignores the man of jesus christ right so it really really never really applied. But yeah we could have uh it never really applied to me for uh christianity because now, I know it's a, a theistic argument, absolutely, mm -hmm. but specifically it can't apply to Christians because we believe God is Jesus, right? And the reason we believe God is Jesus because of his resurrection and vindication through history as a historical event. Um, well, so I'm not sure. So that would be like a natural. Well, okay, so here's how they would respond to that, right? So they, they can grant you the resurrection, like they, they do. They grant you all the miracles you want. And then it's kind of like how they respond to the religious experiences. They say, yeah, but that's an evil God. He's trying to trick you. He wants you to believe in. They, now, they're typically unnuanced, right? They don't say that Christianity is unique. They'll grant, oh, there's yeah, competing okay, miracles. Yeah, okay, so when I, uh, okay, so let me, let me throw this at you then. Maybe I'm not being clear. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, they could grant me the resurrection, they could grant me miracles, they could say, I don't think they have a very good strong case to say that Jesus was a uh, evil guy, and he was trying to trick us, um, well, he wouldn't have needed to done good things to trick us, he could have fooled us other ways, you know, and that's unfortunately not dealing with the evidence at hand that Jesus himself said he's good, you know, well that's, you know? well that's, that God is good, so you'd have to actually keep the evidence not with a hypothetical saying well he could have just been tricking you no let me see the evidence do you have any evidence that that suggests otherwise i got evidence <laughs> that is validated through history uh i've got uh arguments that the gospels are reliable and the story has been clear and consistent for the last 200 years better preserved than any other ancient work of history 
Let, and let, this man said he was good, and he rose again on the third day. I'm going to take his word over yours. <laughs> well, let well let me yeah. let me respond. So I agree with you, obviously, yeah. right? But like, here's how they would respond to that. So the miracles and relig- all of this equally supports an evil god, right? And I might bring in the Christian philosopher Perry Hendricks. Um, do you know Perry Hendricks at all? Or? No, you know, I'm not actually familiar with him. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll link to his paper. He's a, yeah, he's, really yeah he's, he's a really great philosopher and that sort of thing, Christian as well. Um, but uh, what about the skeptical theism thesis then, right? You're, you're claiming to have sufficient knowledge that Jesus wasn't just tricking us. I mean, an evil God is omnipotent and omniscient. He, he could set up states of affairs that makes the gospel events all happen, but it's all just one giant trick because God knows that in the end, that will lead to maximizing evil somehow. Well, um, yeah, but here's the thing is, is you're throwing that out as a hypothesis, right? But I'm relying, I'm trusting what the man's ministry was, and he validates himself through that, right? So he validates himself, he validates his ministry by his resurrection. So for me, that's the matter of, of trust at that point, right? That's the matter of like saying, hey, look, he said this, he did this, he validated himself, he proved himself to me. So guess what? That's better evidence than your hypothetical that you're just making up on the fly or you're just So basically, raise the let me see if I can break this down just real quick, just so I'm understanding. So what you're saying, David, is that even though Jesus said these things, he validated by historical events. Where the atheist or the person with the evil god challenge to say, well, what if, what if, what if? Yeah, right? yeah, you know, we can't, our, we can't build our lives on what ifs, you know. Uh, you know, so well, if I'm going to be a good scientist or a good, uh, uh, um, you know, a good student or whatever, I'm going to have to look at that evidence and see what, you know, what's what's more probable on that is that I have to, if I'm going to even uh, look at the criteria. I'm that proves history and stuff like that. I'm gonna have to say, hey, look. <laughs> well, uh, so I so I would disagree with what you're saying then. So so let me take the weak, the weak version at least, right? Because the the weak version, they're not making any claims, so they they don't have any burden of proof. Where the strong version, that's law does, he he gives claims. So I, forget about that. But with the weak version, I'm just providing an undercutting defeater for you. For your you believe in a good God. You claim to believe that there's a good God, and your basis is the gospel event or miracles and stuff, let's say, right? And I say, well, no, that can be equally explainable by an evil God. How do you defeat that? And your answer is, what? Well, I think we have these events that happen. Yes. Um, we should just trust that it is as it is. So what, you're, what I think you could do, David, you could appeal to the position, phenomenal conservatism. Things are probably are as they seem to us. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that, but that's in the literature, right? I have, I have mentioned that in my slides that some people appeal to this phenomenal conservative that all things considered, things are probably as they seem to us. So if we read the gospels, we can prove the, these events all happen. You, you, Mr. Evil God Challenger are giving me that all these miracles of Jesus happen. Well, he's probably as he seems, he seems like a good guy. So probably he is, you can make that argument. I wouldn't buy it, but you could you could but do it. Well, here's the problem with that, though. Here's the problem with what you're saying, though, is that you're holding a, a standard that, to me, would be nonsensical. I mean, if, if, if this guy proved himself through history, all right, he did these these things, all right. He said he's good. All the evidence points to that he's good because of all those things that have happened, right? But it could be a so, trick. And that's the thing, but it could be a trick. I have no reason to believe that. I have you give me no reason to believe that. You so, have given me no evidence to support that. Right. But when, right. Like, when so the like, position you, there's three dogs ask the attitudes, right? You believe something when you have evi- on an evidentialist perspective, 51% or more proof that it's probably true. You disbelieve something if it's 49% or less probability of being true. If it's 50-50, if I've given you no reason to think that it is a trick, but you've given me no reason to think I have. That I have. He's done every, everything he's done has been good. You're just you're the one that's just saying, well, what if? Well, I have no reason to trust that because 
you're giving me no evidence to say there's a 50 50 at all you're giving me you're just giving me a hypothetical that's zero percent to me i mean this guy has healed people he's given sight to the blind alleviated people's suffering he is uh uh um redeemed said he's redeemed mankind and then added, after all of that he brings somebody back from the dead whoa then after that guess what he proves he proves throughout his ministry that he's not only the god of uh the, the god of that takes sin away from the world uh the god that forgives sin uh the god that can control the storms the god that can uh 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 do all those i am statements you know like he, he, he's the bread of living water he, he proves himself yeah, you know, there are two. So I've got two. all this evidence, and you really just oh well. But, it, okay, but it's well. it's symmetric. It, it's okay on its own. It's symmetrical evidence, though. Like it, right. it, it's e the explanation that it's a trick for an evil god, an omnipotent, omniscient, omnimalevolent god is equal unless you give me reason. So here's two reasons that you can give. So one is that phenomenal conservatism. It, it is things are as they seem. Here's another argument you could you could do that I mentioned in the show, right? And I, I didn't get into the details, but some people say that, well, look, an evil God entails that, remember that evil God star hypothesis that an, if an evil God exists, he has to create torture world. We wouldn't have the amount of good that we have in this world, uh, or at the very least, we wouldn't have the good that Jesus did in this world if an evil God existed. And you would need to provide a reason as to why that's true, why that's the case, in order to defeat the evil God challenge. Instead of just saying that Jesus did these things, and even if it isn't, you know, backed up by verifiable evidence, all of that still could be that trick that you're talking about, Dale. Am I, am I following? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And, I, yeah, I, I, I think I'm yeah, and, and for me, like, I can't buy that at all. Right. But I, I just can't. It just doesn't make sense to me. It's not even a theater, if you ask me, because you haven't given me anything to suggest otherwise so let me ask so like uh, i would think that that what is your question your challenge any merit at all it's it's because i'm not making any as an evil god challenger i'm not making claims right. i don't have any burden of proof only you're you not do. saying that it is a trick you're just saying that it could be yeah right? yeah that's the difference it's a it's an undercutting defeat at least with the weak version the strong version right. is making claims so therefore the atheist had does have at least some burden yeah, of proof. I guess I'm just right. like G more like I you, you, you know I don't have I don't have any reason to be skeptical. Uh also I think the God has revealed himself. I mean he is God. So right. he, you know, he revealed I am the omniscient one. You know and just because you say well what if he's doing this well like I said like G more says you know I have no good reason to believe it. Let me ask you know, it just cuts it out. He just he, he just he just pushes it off as nonsensical, right? Because he's like, unless you can provide reason, you, you know, and I know you're not making you know, you're saying you're not making a claim, but you know, there's always that underlying idea that there's a claim involved. So I mean, if you presented me a challenge, a challenge to me, I think you would have to justify that challenge. It's just my personal opinion. Let, okay. let me ask this right. real quick, guys. Let me ask this. So given the fact, like, let's just say that Jesus is God, whether he's evil God or good God, would the fact that he never did sin, the fact that he never did trick anybody, would that be sufficient evidence to say that Jesus is that good God? And if the premise that is granted that Jesus is God, what we're arguing is whether he's evil or good, the fact that he never did anything wrong, he was sinless, does that not show um again you would need to attach like an additional reason to think that it's not a trick um, gotcha. yeah gotcha. um and and you got david's been hinting at a couple at least three reasons that i i could see right like so he a third thing in addition to the phenomenal conservatism and the, the other thing i mentioned um you you can also maybe argue that we should expect so you would go against perry Hendricks and the skeptical theism thesis and you should you would you would have to argue look we're in the small garden you would expect to see the rabbit if if jesus is an evil god you would expect to see at least some that he wouldn't be morally perfect there would be at least one right. evil thing or trick or something yeah to give the game and, away. And, and, well, you know, here's, and here's another thing that bothers me you could basically it, I, you could do this with all aspects of reality you know you could basically instead of an evil god be evil reality or you could do evil uh uh, uh or or you could use like okay 
so evolution or old earth creation is false well what if it's actually young you know so that that that's not a defeater <laughs> it's just sorry I, I see what you're saying though i think you, you, could, I you could play that okay. game with anything and anything doing doing thing. that if you live consistently with that i don't think you could live consistently because then you're going around questioning everything exactly you would you, you i think it's radical skepticism. i think uh, it's uh, philosophical skepticism at its height so you know, oh it's so this that. so this is so uh, yeah. believe me i That's disagree but this is I, I remember from what, from what i've been interrupting you <laughs> oh, no so, so this is cool because perry i perry hendrix is a joker by the way again doesn't mean anything so you don't know him but like anyway so like he was getting into a debate with an atheist philosopher named bruce russell um who's a, an expert on the problem of evil and I, I linked to his paper for you guys but uh last night um but yeah he, he was in a debate and he brought this challenge up this young earth creationist challenge against skeptical theism it says oh well you just have to be skeptical about everything um but I, I that's not true right because again if you're critic if you're faithful to the way the burden of proof works properly look with young earth creationists we have a reason so if i if i make a claim the earth is old the earth is 13 billion years old or 4 billion years old whatever it is that's my claim and i don't provide any proof and then someone goes no nah, I, I think the earth what if the earth is young how do you know the earth is old Okay, now you got to prove it. You don't go to me, but you haven't proven the earth isn't young. So there you go. You know, I I just trust the earth is old. No, that's not the the thing to do. Is you provide a reason. So here's my reason. I I think that young earth creationism is extremely ad hoc um, because they can come up in certain cases with the flood, universal global flood. They can explain a lot of the evidence equally. So they in a lot of cases, not in all cases, they do have equal explanatory power um, and possibly explanatory scope, at least at a superficial level. Once you get down in the depths, I think it starts to fail. Yes. But yeah. look, at a superficial level, they do have this, they're on par. They have equal explanatory power, equal explanatory scope um, through the flood or thing. But in order to make that work, it's so ad hoc because they have one explanation that explains sedimentary layering and a different one that explains dendrochronology and why that that went wrong and stuff and when you put that together i don't think they gel they don't fit they're not as simple as just saying well, the earth is old and and there's different mechanisms over time operating so that was my i'm providing a reason as to that right. no, I, I hear what you're saying dale but i think that it could be done like that i think you could actually make an argument mm -hmm. along those lines uh you, you know if it's of course it's going to be you know, I'm, I'm thinking off the fly here, so I'm not going to have like a, a good way to present that. But like, I would say the exact same thing goes when you're dealing with Jesus. You have to deal with the question of who do you say that I am, and everybody has to deal with that that point. Who do you say Jesus Christ is? You're going to have a view, right? So you can't, you you, you, you know. So I don't. That's why I don't think it works with Christianity because you actually have a man that claimed he was God provided evidence and provided the evidence of his nature and yeah you're gonna have to have a view either way you just can't come with this challenge of that that he's just tricking you i mean you've got to deal with the evidence that we have on hand uh of who he is so out of curiosity do you think i kind of let the audience down that like i should have had like no. a jesus based asymmetry no, in some way or no 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 no, no, no. No, I think your art. I think the argument works for uh, theism versus atheism. Uh, so yeah, like I Go really on. do. I think it really works. Uh, you know, establishing that you know the evil that there is that there can't be an evil god, right? Yeah, and I, and I will admit, like the evil god challenge for me was the biggest problem. So I'm weird. Uh, I know Caleb was saying it's not, but at the time I was a general theist at the time, right? I didn't believe in Christianity, yeah. so maybe that's. That I didn't have the same evidence that we have all have now in terms of Jesus and stuff. So maybe that's why. Right. And you know, and, and people and, and people need that, you know. So it's not like you, you let anybody down. I mean, people yeah. need all the varying aspects, right? Uh not everybody's me. I'm I, I truly I put a lot of stock mm -hmm. in history and historical evidence. It's, I put a lot of stock in theology. I don't I, I'm not I've got one that says that. If something seems natural or 
I don't I don't think there's such a demarcation between naturalism and supernaturalism, right? Yeah. I don't think so. Oh, we should we should go with the we talked about this. Um, we should go with the natural explanation over the supernatural. No, that's super, let's yeah. look at the evidence, right? Yeah. So that's kind of like where I come from. So like when it comes to like Jesus, man, I think we have the best evidence through him. Um, you, you know, I, I, I think we have the best evidence to come to a truthful conclusion on who he is or what he's given us. Yeah. And it can't, and I don't think you can throw a natural dude at me and say, well, you know, uh, that's, that's you know, the way I, this way, this way. Well, uh, well I, I shouldn't have to accept this. That's just human, you know, skepticism at its best. Yeah. You know, no, let's just examine the evidence. Let's talk about it. Uh, yeah, we can do all that. But at the end of the day, I think that you can't separate the two when it comes down to it. I think there's a there's not this this gulf in uh it, between the, the the curtain of supernaturalism and, and I feel I accomplished something.